Welcome to Kid Missing TV. This is our eighth episode. This time, we're going to talk about Missing in Massachusetts, part two. The very first thing that I want to do is talk to you about sort of a human interest piece. Lady Wonder, the psychic or talking horse. Bear with me, folks. I'm not talking about Mr. Ed. <laughs> Lady Wonder, in the 1950s, was a horse who helped to find several missing persons. She had cards that had the alphabet on them that she would flip over with her nose and spell words. Well, a little boy was missing in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, named Danny Matson. She flipped over the cards and spelled Pittsfield Water Wheel. Well, they looked there, they didn't find anything, and the police thought about it, they said, wait a minute. She means Pit Pittsfield Wild Water, which was a quarry there um, that they had previously searched, but they searched again, and they found Danny's remains. Um, <coughs> as I said, she found, helped find other missing kids. Um, you'll see her picture where she's flipping over the cards. She used to answer all sorts of questions. She was... A pretty neat little horse. Um, you'll also see that I have, she has a beautiful gravestone which I've um, captured a picture of. <music> Jesus de la Cruz was six years old when he vanished on a sunny Saturday afternoon, September 28, 1996, from his yard in Lynn, Massachusetts. Jesus was six years old. He was a Hispanic male. The main suspect in the case is a man named Robert C. Levesque, whose whose last, re last known residence was in Lowell, although at the time of Jesus' disappearance, he lived right around the corner from him. Um, the search for Jesus was massive. Uh, the case is obviously still open at the Lynn Police Department. They, they searched everywhere, including a big cemetery called Pine Grove. They had roadblocks. Um, the FBI went so far as to remove Jesus' desk from his classroom to scour it for fingerprints. I'm not exactly sure why. I'm going to find a bunch of little kids' fingerprints, in my opinion. Um, the only other missing child case out of Lynn was Ernesto Gonzalez from his father's downtown Lynn apartment in 2008. It's amazing that a town the size of Lynn has only had two missing children. That, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, we'd prefer the number to be zero, but we'll take two. <laughs> um, what I'd like to do right now is read you the particulars in Spanish, in, in Espanol. Um, thank you to Iziar Lezcano. That's I-Z-I-A-R-L-A-Z-K-A-N-O for this translation. Desaparecido. Desde el 28 de septiembre, 1996, Dillon, Massachusetts, Edad 6. Suspectoso, Robert C. Levesque. If you have any information about the disappearance of Jesus de la Cruz, please call the Lynn Police Department at 781-595-2000. Taj Narbonne, age 9, disappeared on Monday, March 30th, 1981. Tosh had been staying at his grandparents' home in Fitchburg. Uh, he, was, he was dreading going back home to his mother and his stepfather. Uh, his stepfather wasn't a very nice man. And when he was told he was going home, he even said, with Clarence there, no way. But he didn't really have a choice. Um... The grandmother said 
And I quote, the thing is, it was rough. It still is. And I'll never forgive Clarence or myself for letting him go back there. His grandmother, Eunice Narbonne, said. He went missing the very next day. Um, the detective on the case is Lemonster Detective Patrick Avishan. Um, the possibility is remote, he said. That the, that the child this age would have gone off to um, start his own life. He's absolutely right. When you're that young and you run away, you tend to not go very far. You tend to come right back by dinner time, you know. Um, my cousin and I did it. We were seven, maybe. We took our grandmother's old suitcase and we thought we were going to live in the woods. <laughs> we didn't get past his apartment. Um, so, you know, until my mother came, my parents came looking for me. <laughs> so I think he's absolutely right in that regard. Um, Clarence Dean, the stepfather, treated Taj horribly, Abishan said. He, he, um, was abusive. He was a black man who taunted him, calling him White King and other racial insults. He was actually jealous because his wife loved her son. Ridiculous. Um, later that very same year, in December, he actually kidnapped Taja's mom in a car to go to the Lemonster State Forest and he served two years in jail. Uh, actually, he stabbed her also and spent two years in jail for this crime. Um, this man will probably never be prosecuted because he is currently in a state hospital. Um, he is so mentally out of it that he cannot even be interviewed, um, according to Detective Abishan. The night the Taj went to uh, disappeared, the mother recalls that they went to bed around midnight. She woke up at 1.30 alone in the bed. Um, he pretended, Clarence Dean tend, pretended to startle her in a joking manner. She, she looks back on it and she realizes that when they had a drink that night, that he put something in her drink to make sure she stayed asleep so that he could do whatever he had planned for Taj is her belief. Um, again, he's the prime suspect. At this point, I don't think he can even tell him where Taj is um, because of how ill he is. Again, he's in Bridgewater State. He is so incoherent that, as I've said, interviews were impossible, answers were questionable. So while there'll never be a conviction in this case, hopefully someday he'll get enough of his mental faculties to at least tell someone where this child is. If you have any information in the disappearance of Taj Narbonne, please call Lemonster Detective Patrick Abishan at 978-534-7560, extension 345. <laughs>
Richard Jake Quimby has since passed away. Before he passed away, the chief wrote him a letter. Chief Marshall said he wanted to let him know he'd keep trying to find answers for the family. At least once a month, Chief Marshall, Chief Marshall meets with two volunteer investigators with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. We've been doing some re-interviewing and some polygraph tests. They even traveled to Oregon and to New York following up on leads. The chief will not say who has been interviewed or polygraphed. Uh, there have been recent inconsistencies in people's stories. So they're very hopeful, even after 37 years of funding answers in this case. Um, I think some of the inconsistencies recently are probably due to, due to 37 years having passed. <laughs> I mean, that's a long time. People may not remember things exactly the way they did back then. It may not be anything sinister even. Just the passage of time. Um, if you have any information on the disappearance of Deborah Ann Quimby, please call the Townsend Police Department at 978-597-6214. Melanie Melanson was 14 years old when she disappeared on October 27, 1989. She and I would be the same age. Um, she went to a party in the woods on the Woburn Stoneham line. She was from Woburn. She entered the woods with friends and was never seen again. That sounds so ominous, doesn't it? But it's the truth. Her body has never been found and no arrests have ever been made in the case. Um, authorities believe she is deceased. They believe several of the party goers had something to do with her demise. Um, Eleven teams of, of cadaver dogs did a systematic grid search to comb the section of Middlesex Fells Reservation in Stoneham Woods used to be connected to the Woburn Woods where Melanson was last seen. The woods are no longer connected to each other. Um, they did not find anything in this particular search. Uh, Melanie's aunt, Karen Montgomery, 56, told ABC News, quote, the family believes Melanie's body might have been moved from one set of woods to the other. She's very hopeful that there will be a breakthrough in the case soon. It's like a 23-year funeral on holidays and her birthday. There's times you wish she was here and it's hard, Montgomery said. It's tough enough when you lose a parent when they're older. And that's the circle of life, but not a 15-year-old girl. She was about to turn 15 within a couple of days of her disappearance. That's why she said that. Um, her birthday would have been November 1st. She wouldn't have run away, said her aunt, because she was looking forward to her birthday. Her father was getting her these really neat leather boots she had been wanting for her birthday. Um, and she was pretty excited about that. In 2013, the search still continued for answers. Uh, and in fact, three billboards are in place north of Boston with her photo and information on them as of 2013. That's wonderful. A lot of people go through that area. Um, if you have any information about the disappearance of Melanie Melanson, please call the Mass State Police Assigned District 781-897-6600. Jennifer Lynn Fay. This is probably a name you've heard before. She disappeared November 14, 1989 at age 16 years old from Brockton, Massachusetts. Uh, Jennifer's case has been all over the news because new witnesses have come forward. Um, 
The police are hoping to paint a clearer picture of what happened to her the night that she disappeared. Um, as a matter of fact, the mayor of the city of Brockton called for the case to be reactivated. A private investigator has worked on the case since 2005. And they frequently receive new leads, but none has led to finding Jennifer. These recent tips, she said, seem promising. I firmly believe that Jennifer did not leave the city and that her remains will be found in the city of Brockton. Um, some people are corroborating information that, they are, that investigators already had, or at least thought they had. Um, But they, some of these people, um, but they don't have probable cause to get a search warrant based on these tips yet. Um, but at least four people of varying ages have provided information over the last year. Again, it is now believed that her remains are somewhere in Brockton. Jennifer has a foundation called the Jennifer Lynn Fay Foundation. It helps with missing children. Um, you can go to their website, jenniferlynnfayfoundation.org, for more on this case and many others. This case interested me for, an, for a totally uh, different reason. When I first started doing missing children, it was one of the first ones that I came upon from Massachusetts. And um, before all the recent news has broken on the case, I looked at her picture, and so did my mom. And there was immediate recognition. She looks just like my lifelong best friend's sister. And he here's the spooky part. <clears throat> they have the same last name. I don't know whether... There's some kind of distant uh, relationship, you know, ancestry there. I'd be willing to bet there probably is. But I had to share that with you because I thought that was really spooky. Um, the number to call if you have any information in the case of Jennifer Lynn Fay is 508-328-9285. Again, or go to the JenniferLynnFayFoundation.org. On June 5th, 1982, Judith Ann Chartier, age 17, disappeared. She'd gone to a party with her boyfriend. She had driven him home after an argument. Um, the party was held in Bill Ritka. She went back to the party after she drove him home. She was there until approximately 2 a.m. when she left alone, unfortunately. Um, she never returned to her home in Chelmsford, Massachusetts. And the, the town of Chel Chelmsford is four miles from the city of Lowell and is located on Interstate 495 of the Boston Metro Outer Beltway. Um, she worked at a fast food restaurant in Chelmsford at the time of her disappearance. Um, she was being harassed by a male co-worker, according to her family at the time. Um, he he's not a suspect in the case, although I'm sure that the fellow employees all were questioned about their whereabouts that night. Um, there was there is a very good suspect in this case. Uh, this is a man who is a suspect in other cases, actually in other parts of the country, because he's traveled extensively. Um, his name is Debar de Laban. Um, and he, James Mitchell de Bartolaben, he was not only an in, infamous counterfeiter, but he was a sexual sadist as well. Um, he is believed to have murdered 
several brunette women over an 18 year span. He was arrested on May 25, 1983 in Knoxville, Tennessee. Secret Service agents searched his 1971 Chrysler, seizing evidence including a receipt from a motel in Chelmsford, Massachusetts, dated June 4th, the day before Judith Ann's disappearance. Other content seized included a map of Chelmsford, a receipt from a local motel, again dated June 4th, um, a police badge, a substantial amount of porn, with several photos of women involved in sadomasochistic acts, numerous license plates and fake driver's licenses, prescription drugs, firearms. Um, DeBartolabin was known to travel most of the United States, passing counterfeit bills throughout shopping malls. While um, they, um, they were searching for his printing press in a storage locker revealed him to be a serial sexual sadist. Evidence seized included bloody panties, cassette and audio recordings of torture, um, so badly that the women were begging him to either stop torturing them or just kill them. Um, a, I'm going to try to say this in a way that won't offend anyone. Um, facsimile of male anatomy, let's put it this way, um, and lubricant for said facsimile of male anatomy um, were found. Handcuffs, um, again, more photos of females doing, being forced to do horrible things, again, more audio tapes. Um, where he talks about building a safe house to continue doing these things to women. Um, he was sentenced to 375 years in prison. He will spend the rest of his life there. Yeah, I think that's safe to say. Um, in 2012, investigators searched the home on Gorham Street in, Ch in Chelmsford following a discovery that they thought could lead to a break in the case of Judith Ann Chartier. Um, police recovered bones, and they, have, they were sent to a lab. Um, they were not Judith's. I would like to I tell you that DeBarta Laban is also a suspect in a case that I actually featured on my um, radio show, so I was pretty familiar with his nastiness. Um, this man is cruelly evil and is exactly where he belongs. The phone number, if you have any information about the case of Judith Ann Chartier, is the Chelmsford Police Department at 978-256-2521. This episode's special feature of case. This case is hugely near and dear to my heart. Um, this is the case of Sarah Pryor. Sarah was abducted and murdered when I was 11 years old. She was nine. Um, this was in 19, this was October 1985. She was taken from a walk near her Wayland, Massachusetts home. Um, I never, like I said, I, I never forgot Sarah. She's the reason that I do what I do. Her case changed my life. Because all of a sudden it just wasn't safe anymore. You know? A kid that age could be taken from, as it turns out, 41 miles away. You know, and it was pretty scary to be an 11-year-old kid walking to school every day with that in the back of your mind. Um, and I used to <laughs> sit on the rides at Whalen Park and think about Sarah, because Whalen Wayland was close in name to me, and I was a little kid. Um, never forgot her. There is a suspect um, in her case. She was, by the way, walking north on Route 126. They have tracked every lead 
across this country and into Canada and have come up with one suspect. One John Wertie was from Sherburne, Massachusetts. He denies killing Sarah. Um, but Massachusetts, Massachusetts investigators say he is the prime suspect. And he's the likely suspect in the disappearance of Stowe teenager Kathy Malcolmson. What I'd like to do right now, <coughs> pardon me, is to insert video here of episode one of this program where I spoke about Kathy Malcolmson. So you can just sort of get an idea about Kathy, her case, and the linkage to this case. Kathy was 16 years old when she disappeared on August 13, 1985. It took them two years to find her bicycle thrown in the woods along Grendale Road in Hudson. She was from Hudson. She was traveling to her job as a cashier in Stowe, the neighboring town. She never made it. Um, she was last seen carrying a gray pocketbook, wearing sneakers, a short sleeve striped shirt, which was probably her work shirt. Um, she, her case is believed to be linked to that of Sarah Pryor, who I mentioned to you in our introduction. Um, they believe that John Wordy, a convicted child killer, who is in a Texas prison now, um, is responsible for both of their both her disappearance and the, the disappearance and homicide of Sarah Pryor. Sarah's family has done everything they can each time he's come up for parole to see that he does not ever step foot out of a Texas prison because they'll never get justice for their daughter. Uh, two months before Sarah is when Kathy disappeared. The Milford police chief, the current Milford police chief was on Sarah's case in Wayland before he transferred to Milford and ultimately became their chief. Um, scary enough, John Wordy, who is a convicted child killer, who sits in a Texas prison job, was installing playground equipment. Yikes! <laughs> Just yikes. Um, because he murdered a 15-year-old girl in Dallas. And, of course, Texas does not take kindly to that. Um, he also kidnapped a Newton woman at Knife Point, or is believed to. No, he served five years in a Massachusetts prison for that. Um, and was transferred back to Texas for violating parole for kidnapping this woman. He never should have been out on parole in Texas in the first place. Um, there are actually quite a few pictures for this story. There is a picture of Sarah, of course. There's also a picture of beautiful, it's a statue and has her dog, a written plaque, and it has her sled in the park in Wayland, where she used to like to go. Um, and on kind of a sad note, Sarah only moved to Massachusetts just six weeks before her disappearance from Pennsylvania. Her father became very involved in local politics, um, eventually moved back to their home in Pennsylvania, where he continued to be involved in local politics. Um, you'll also, um, the, the prior family was with the Bish family when they buried Molly. There was actually a picture of them comforting the Bish family. The only thing the prior family ever got to bury were small skull fragments that were found in 1995 and were um, identified by DNA in 1998 as belonging to Sarah. I will never forget walking past the television seeing Sarah's picture up there 
after all those years. I stopped dead in my tracks and got chills. They had finally found her. Although not the way I'd always hoped they'd find her. Um, you will also see a beautiful picture of Sarah's absolutely gorgeous headstone. Um, it's a picture. It's a picture of Sarah, with wings, angel wings. It's incredible, incredibly moving um, tribute to a young lady that disappeared um, and was killed way too soon. Uh, again, there was another suspect early on, and it's kind of funny because Whitey Bulger was asked to visit a suspect who was in prison. And um, he kind of scared the poop out of the guy, and Whitey and his compadre that went to visit him told, told the FBI he wasn't involved. He's telling the FBI decided, excuse me, that the suspect wasn't involved, and they concluded he was telling the truth. Again, because he was absolutely terrified of Bulger and his compadre that went to, to visit him. I can't imagine sitting there in jail and having somebody like that walk in to question me. That, that would just be absolutely terrifying, you know. Like I said, scared the bleep out of him. <laughs> Thank you for joining us for Kid Missing TV. Um, before I go, I have a couple of programming notes. Next time, we will be talking about children missing for over 30 years. And next time, we will be on a brand new channel, channel 191. We are going digital. Thank you again for joining us. Good night, and God bless you all.